Once there were four children, whose names were Peter, Susan, Edmund and Lucy. Hello, I'm Jem, the reader at St John the Baptist's Parish Church in Beeston. And in this rather strange time, when we can't meet together as a church for worship, I thought something rather fun and perhaps worthwhile to do would be to read through a book together, chapter by chapter. Uh, and the book I've chosen, as you've probably already worked out, is The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. It's a familiar book to many. I've picked it partly on the reason that some of you may have a copy of it in your house. But it's a book that I think repays rereading and thinking about. So these talks aren't intended to be sermons or theological instruction, but they are a chance to read through the book and to have a think about it, uh, setting it in perhaps its literary and its religious contexts. So I'll be reading along chapter by chapter and noting the things that particularly strike uh, or jump out at me from the text. I'm sure there will be things that jump out at you and they're probably not going to be the same things. So I'd really like it if you perhaps left some comments below um, saying what you thought about when you read the chapter and uh, perhaps replying to some of the stuff that I've been saying. So, chapter one, Lucy w looks into a wardrobe. If you haven't read this chapter yet, go away and read it. Uh, it begins, once there were four children whose names were Peter, Susan, Edmund and Lucy, and read all the way to... And when he saw Lucy, he gave such a start of surprise that he dropped all his parcels. Goodness gracious me, exclaimed the fawn. So, the first thing that jumped out of me when I read this chapter was the very first words. I won't be going through the entire book sentence by sentence, but I was really struck when it says, Once there were four children whose names were Peter, Susan, Edmund and Lucy. And it goes on. This story is about something that happened to them when they were sent away from London during the war because of the air raids. They were sent to the house of an old professor who lived in the heart of the country, ten miles from the nearest railway station and two miles from the nearest post office. Now, later I might mention the significance of the remoteness of the house, but to start off with them, once there were four children, that beginning seems to me to combine two different kinds of fictional time. Uh, we have the fairy tale time, once upon a time, once there were four children whose names were Peter, Susan, Edmund and Lucy, the time of storybooks and legends and myths. It's not historically tethered in the same way that the next sentence. The next sentence is, this story is about something that happened to them when they were sent away from London during the war because of the air raids. So that gives us a specific historical point. Um, a point, of course, that most of the people reading this book uh, certainly in its, in its first publication, would be familiar with, because after all, this was published in 1950, five years after the end of the Second World War. So at the same time, we have this slightly misty, slightly storybook, Once Upon a Time, and then we also have a specific datable historical event. From a literary point of view, it reminds me slightly of the, or rather a lot actually, of the beginning of George Eliot's novel Silas Marner, which talks about the spinners and the weavers and spinning wheels in cottages uh, and little men coming out of the hills, perhaps as if they were goblins or elves, but at the same time makes it clear that this is happening in the 19th century and the spinning wheels are part of the economic uh, and social functioning of the Midlands. And Eliot does a, a rather similar thing of switching between the mysterious and the fantastical and the fairy tale and the definite and the precise uh, and even the, the economic and sociological. And her story is, is of course, a, a sort of fable, uh, a, a retelling of the perhaps the Rumpelstiltskin story within the uh, industrial landscape of the Midlands of the 19th century. <clears throat> Here, perhaps, it's more subtle, but I think we do have this blending of these two different kinds of times. And the reason that particularly struck me is that C.S. Lewis elsewhere wrote about the kinds of fictional time that you find in the Bible. You find both the, the legendary, the saga-esque, a lot of the stories of the Old Testament perhaps uh, have something of this, where heroic characters emerge sort of from, from the mists of time and carry out their, uh, their actions and their stories slightly in abstract ways, slightly in, in suspension from the rest of the world. But then elsewhere you have quite specific things. It was this number of generations after this happened, or particularly when you get into the, the New Testament, they passed through this town and they went over here and they took a ship and they went over there. Um, actually, it's something that, that C.S. Lewis said that he find he found the 
the fictional mode of the Old Testament rather more to his taste than he did, particularly as someone who was who was fond of legend and myth. Uh, he found it, it suited his literary tastes more than the New Testament, which was quite a statement for someone who was so, such a passionately devoted follower of Christ. Um, so it, I'm not I'm saying it's largely a literary point, rather a religious one, but it's interesting that in setting out his children's book, he begins with a similar kind of blending of different kinds of time. So, having having paused for that length of time on the first few sentences, let's move along a little bit. So in the, in this first chapter, the children arrive at the house of the professor. They imagine uh, some of the fun they will have in these uh, in its environs. They play a game in which Lucy goes and hides in a wardrobe, and she finds herself creeping through the coats in the wardrobe till she finds what appears to be a snowy wood with a lamp post in it, and then a very, very peculiar person comes round the corner. As I say, I won't be taking you uh, page by page of the story, and I'll assume you know uh, the story either from long familiarity or from just having read it. So to pass on to the next thing that, that jumped out of me, I was really struck by the list of animals that they imagined. This is a, a slightly oblique point, possibly, but here we are. What's that noise, said Lucy suddenly. It was a far larger house than she'd ever been in before, and the thought of all those long passages and rows of doors leading into empty rooms was beginning to make her feel a little creepy. Pause there for anyone who's read all the Narnia novels, because I think there's a distinct touch of the Dawn Treader in there. An image of Lucy being frightened by a, a long corridor with a long series of doors. It's not perhaps definitely a, a plot reference. I don't know how much he'd, he'd plotted out of the later stories, but that's definitely part of the, the tone, the ethos of the books. And perhaps we'll come back to that later. It's only a bird, silly, said Edmund. It's an owl, said Peter. This is going to be a wonderful place for birds. I shall go to bed now. I say, let's go and explore tomorrow. You might find anything in a place like this. Did you see those mountains as we came along? And the woods? There might be eagles. There might be stags. There'll be hawks. Badgers, said Lucy. Foxes, said Edmund. Rabbits, said Susan. And the... Those lists of animals are obviously, they're all woodland animals. I think is quite shrewd characterisation on Lewis's part, and it's setting up in our minds some of the things that we'll later see in the more sort of magical and fantastical parts of the story. Because Peter imagines eagles, stags and hawks. Lucy imagines badgers, Edmund imagines foxes, and Susan imagines rabbits. So Peter is going to be High King Peter, the, the, the noble character, he imagines eagles, the, uh, the king of the, the bird kingdom. Um, he imagines stags, the suitable quarry, the, the great beast of venery, the suitable quarry for a king or a great noble to hunt. And he imagines hawks. And again, falconry uh, and hawking is a suitable pastime for a, a great noble lord or a king. So his imagination already seems to be working along the lines that we'll see him installed in fictionally later. Lucy imagines badgers. I don't think this means that Lucy, Lucy wants to find a wood and dig herself a hole and sort of truffle around in it. What I do think is that badgers are stalwart creatures, the, the brock of the old English story. Um, I think they're, they're tenacious, they're sturdy. And again, in thinking forward, those of you who know it, to Prince Caspian, badgers don't forget and badgers hold on to the old ways. And that's something that Lucy is, of course, going to have to do. She's going to have to be sturdy, independent perhaps slightly solitary, not caring what people think, holding on to what she knows. Edmund imagines foxes, the renard of the medieval French tale, cunning, clever, perhaps a little bit sly, perhaps a little bit dishonest, um, a, a slinking creature. Uh, again, this, this seems to be setting up what we, if we've read the book, what we know Edmund will get involved in later. Um, so his imagination is, is sharp and quick, but it's also perhaps a little bit morally dubious. Um, he, he, he looks to see a, a creature that is, uh, as I say, sly and perhaps even slightly conniving. And Susan imagines rabbits, little fluffy bunnies. This seems terribly unfair on Susan, but as a lot of people have said, so sometimes the books do seem to be a bit unfair on Susan. Um, her imagination conjures up something fuzzy and sweet and, and sort of cuddleable. So even um, relatively early here, we seem to be seeing the characters develop, which will express themselves in both the action of the novels and in the characteristics they'll take on when they become the kings and queens of Narnia. This is a, a clever fictional trick, I think. It's, it's good fictional psychology. 
But it's also there's also a religious point there, or a, perhaps um, a religious literary point. After all, when the, the characters find their way into Narnia, they don't totally change. They aren't given entirely new personalities. They're encouraged or allowed to develop the characteristics and the personalities which they already have. There's a continuity in this novel between the magical and the fantastical and the, 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 the supernatural world they're going to in, encounter and the normal everyday world of their lives. Now, this is a, obviously a fundamental point of, of religious thinking in Christianity. It's one that Lewis was, was very keen on. Um, it's perhaps particularly stressed in the evangelical and reformed traditions. Um, and Lewis had a, had a strong dose of that in his religious personality. Um, sometimes the reformed and evangelical traditions are a little bit suspicious of the idea there's a, a particular area of life called religion and that you, uh, you sort of indulge in that and then go back to your everyday life. Obviously, all branches of Christianity believe that that faith should pervade the whole of your life. But perhaps, as I say, the Reformed and Evangelical traditions have a particular suspicion um, of any break between your personality and your faith. And I think this is expressed meaningfully here. So when Lucy does her exploring, she uh, wanders through these passages and ends up uh, in front of this wardrobe, clambers into it, the book's very careful to say she doesn't shut the door because it's very silly to shut yourself in the, in the door. Didn't, didn't want to encourage loads of children to go and getting into accidents. And here we are. It was almost quite dark in there and she kept her arms stretched out in front of her so as not to bump her face into the back of the wardrobe. She step, took a step further in, then two or three steps, always expecting to feel woodwork against the tip of her fingers. But she could not feel it. This must be a simply enormous wardrobe, thought Lucy going in still further and pushing the soft folds of the coats aside to make room for her. Then she noticed there was something crunching under her feet. I wonder if that more mothballs, she, she thought, stooping down to feel it with her hand. But instead of feeling the hard, smooth wood of the floor of the wardrobe, she felt something soft and powdery and extremely cold. At this moment of transformation is, is obviously Lucy going through the portal into the magical world of Narnia. And that, that gave me pause for thought, because there's something, and it's a, perhaps a slightly odd term, but there's something quite gothic about this chapter to me. Um, the, I think it's the critic Fred Botting who described one of the definitive tones of gothic as the experience of exploring the ruins or the, the shell of a much greater and more complex civilization. Um, he used that to argue that the film Alien, for example, is, is a classic piece of gothic. And we can look, look at 19th century or 18th century Gothic, um, the novels of Mrs Radcliffe, perhaps, or Horace Walpole, and see that playing out. Characters camping on the floors of castles or exploring ancient caverns. And there's something, I think, of that going on here. That image, as I said earlier, of Lucy looking down or imagining looking down the passage with all those doors going off it and things she doesn't know possibly hiding behind it. And there's, a, there's a, an ethos all the way through this chapter of the, the children dislocated from their normal life and sent away from the urban life they're used to into the rural heart of England. And what they find there is this great old historical house, this rambling place that they explore. And they find this the magical wardrobe, or at least Lucy does. Um, and there's the, the, the way in which the wardrobe is described made me pause as well. Because there's a stress on wood and woodwork. So she expected to feel the, the wood, but she but she couldn't. Um, sort of feeling the, the hard, smooth wood of the floor of the wardrobe. She felt something softer and powdery and extremely cold. Uh, she, a minute late, moment later, she found she was standing in the middle of a wood at night time with snow under her feet and snowflakes falling through the air. <clears throat> so what she finds is an artefact, of course, made of wood. It's made of the, you know, the wood from this rural heart of England where they're so many miles from the post office and so many miles from the railway station. There's this artefact, this artistic thing that's obviously very old and has somehow transported her into the, the material, the place that it used to be, that it was made of and it used to be part of. Uh, some wood has taken her to a wood. And the wood is a very interesting symbol in literature. Um, it's, it's been used for centuries, I think, to express... Uh, wildness to express the uh, both the attraction and the chill of the ancient. Um, I'd like to read you a passage from a book that was published only one year before Lewis's Lion, Witch in the Wardrobe. Midway this way of life we're bound upon, I woke to find myself in a dark wood. 
where the right road was wholly lost and gone. I me, how hard to speak of it, that rude and rough and stubborn forest, the mere breath of memory stirs the old fear in the blood. It is so bitter it goes nigh to death. Yet there I gain such good that to convey the tale I'll write what else I found therewith. That is the opening of uh, Hell, the Inferno of the Divine Comedy by Dante Alighieri, specifically as translated by Dorothy L. Sayers. Obviously, Dante didn't write it in 1949, but um, Sayers' translation was published in 1949. And Dante's poem begins with him midway in life, lost in a wood, befuddled, confused, and it's at this point that his journey towards enlightenment begins. And it's striking that, that Lucy's enlightenment happens literally in a slightly confusing way, where she finds this rather surreal object, this lamppost, uh, iron and gas thing in the middle of a wood, growing as if it was a, a, a tree of the forest itself. We can see other woods in literature, look at uh, Much Ado About Nothing or As You Like It, um, or we can look forward indeed to something like The Wind of the Willows, where the plot of that novel really starts in earnest when a small, innocent character, Lucy or perhaps Mole, finds their way into uh, a great wood, the wild wood in the case of Wind of the Willows, uh, and becomes befuddled and confused, but finds at the centre of that wood, in the case of Wind of the Willows, Badger's house, where there is light and comfort, and things are explained to Mole. It's also worth pointing out, given the, the similar lines of the imagination running here, that we discover that Badger's house, with its cellars and tunnels, is actually built on the ruins of a, a great city that stood there centuries and centuries before. It's mentioned very casually in the, in the novel, and it's something that modern adaptations often skip over. But Badger says there was this great civilization uh, that used to be here, and the wood has grown over it, and he lives in its ruins. Another very gothic touch. So there's a sense of exploration here, a sense that there is something ancient and strange and organic and powerful, which the characters are finding their way into almost by accident. And again, I don't, I don't think we need to stress too much uh, the connection there with Christianity, with the mid-20th century experience that intellectuals like Lewis and Sayers had of turning to what they thought was stuffy old faith, stuffy old churchiness, and finding something ancient and powerful and living, which was a great narrative, a great story that they had fallen their way into, but which had incredibly deep roots. It seems that some of these these feelings, some of these experiences are being mapped out by the turns that this story is taking. So, we will pause there. I'm not going to discuss Mr Tumnus in this episode because he's so interesting, I think I'm going to keep him for the beginning of the next episode. Um, but I hope that, that gave you something to think about. It certainly caused me to, to think furiously and ponder, having reread that. I was really surprised and delighted on rereading this chapter of just how much there is to dig in and, and think and ponder about. Um, next time we'll be reading What Lucy Found There. So if you want to do your reading in advance, go and read from Good evening, said Lucy, but the fawn was so busy picking up its parcels that at first it did not reply. And read all the way, turning the pages, to... It was still raining and she could hear the voices of the others in the passage. I'm here, she shouted. I'm here. I've come back. I'm all right. So I look forward to speaking to you next time.